Uh, hi, my name is Michael Keeling. I'm here to talk to you today, today about uh, architecture, decision records, and uh, action, and uh, the brightest light ever uh, that's sitting over there right in your face. Okay, uh, so uh, question, how do you share uh, important design decisions on your team? Uh, on my team, we, we rely very heavily on uh, oral history to do this, right? So you can almost imagine, you know, everyone, please gather around. Let's talk about how the database will interact with the, uh, you know, the, the microservices, right? Oral history is really great, and we, uh, we get a lot out of it, a huge benefit, especially when we are early in the design process uh, exploring, um, exploring different ideas, right? But uh, Oral history has some serious limitations, okay? So uh, very limited reach. I'm talking basically one-on-one -on -one or, or in small groups of individuals who are uh, only privy to that one conversation. Um, time consuming to share. I have to go talk to every person who I want to share this idea with. Uh, without constant attention, right, the, the um, ideas that you have shared will, will basically die out, right? And, and ev with every retelling, it seems like the stories change, right? So, what may start off as a very clear, crisp view of the world and the design decisions that we've made over time starts, starts to slowly degrade until eventually someday we end up with something that was, uh, I don't know, it's still the gist of what we had in mind. We've lost a few details along the way, but uh, you know, maybe those are important details, maybe not, right? Worst case, if we don't write anything down, uh, pretty soon we're just gonna forget everything, right? Uh, maybe the team moves on, maybe people leave, whatever the case may be, right? Mm. May the fourth be with you, everyone, right? So, so uh, you know, up-to-date documents, something we don't see very often, right, is actually getting things up-to-date, though. So a question that we ask on our team, what is the, kind of with these ideas in mind and wanting to stay light, uh, what's the least documentation that we could write but still remain effective, okay? I always like to try and get away with the least amount of stuff. Um, th so for us, our ideal documentation was going to be something that had a very low barrier to entry, something we can kind of just sneak in, uh, required minimal training, right, or something that we could do training as we go or training on the job. Um, something that the team would perceive as being useful, very, very easy to keep up to date, and perhaps most importantly of all, something that the, the people who don't want to be documenting stuff, the skeptics, would actually go along with and want to and try. Uh, and around this time as we were trying to figure out a good way to, to do this, I found this uh, blog post uh, by Michael Nygaard about uh, architecture decision records. Okay, so uh, you can read more about, uh, about this on, on his website, but the, the basic gist is a, an architecture decision record is a, uh, a very brief uh, text file that captures a single decision uh, and the set of forces uh, that are around that decision. Okay, so it includes uh, uh, the design context, uh, or I'm sorry, the decision itself, the context around that decision, uh, the, uh, the rationale that goes along with it, and then any kind of implications of the decision that you've made, okay? So, all right, uh, this is why we do backup things. So uh, I was originally gonna show this live so that you could actually read the text a little bit, but I took a screenshot. So knowing that the technical problems inevitably happen. So here's an example of an ADR that we have on our, on our team. Okay, you can see a couple of interesting, uh, interesting things here. Um, descriptive, action-oriented title, a number, right? This is the fifth decision that we've made. Uh, ADRs kind of go incrementally uh, as you go, uh, uh, as you're adding more things. Uh, that, those top paragraphs are talking about context, so those forces at play. What is happening, happening in the world that led us to kind of think about this? Uh, the decision itself, you can see, well, maybe you can't see. It says, we will organize the agent with a pipe and filter pattern. Uh, it's a very action-oriented, we will do something. One sentence, the decision, right, called out very clearly. In this particular uh, version, we also have a rationale that we pulled out. We were kind of experimenting with different, uh, different ways of capturing this information. Um, you see a status, this decision was accepted. And then finally at the bottom, uh, consequences of this decision. And what this is saying here uh, is things around uh, team education, uh, new technology that we we're gonna have to use, uh, risks that we would potentially need to accept, uh, uh, things like that. So uh, positive and negative consequences of the world uh, based on the decision that we've made. Okay, uh, so just to review, uh, notice plain, direct language, very, very brief, one to two pages max, okay? Uh, we store ours in Markdown, uh, and we store it with the code uh, where the decision is influencing. Okay, so it goes in the, the exact same code repository. Uh, all right. We have a template. Our ADR template includes uh, all the things you just saw. Um, 
and well, yep, I've got another example of that, and we'll see if you can see it. All the things that you just saw uh, for capturing the context, uh, the consequences, uh, and various uh, types of status of whatever that decision is. Over time, the world changes, right? Uh, a decision could be deprecated or superseded by a, by a new decision. You don't delete the old record, you keep it uh, and add a link to the new thing, uh, to the new, the new decision. Um, all right, let's see if we can see these. All right, uh, here's an example of the template. Uh, tried to pull it out in kind of a text format. Uh, that would be something you guys can see. Uh, notice that we're giving uh, advice, kind of how, how you should think about this or what you should do. Right? So it's, it's a, this is an opportunity for the architect to provide just-in-time education about how to think about a decision and kind of how to fill these things in well. Um, oh, good. It will show the, the hidden stuff. Uh, renders nicely. I don't know if that's... Useful, yeah, sure. So, um, in addition to the template itself, uh, just-in-time information about the, the the methodology, right? What is an architecture decision record? Why are we doing this? Uh, and then all of our uh, decisions go in, again into the version control repository. You can see that we have you know one, two, three, four, on and on and on, right? Okay. Uh, the advice that we give uh, on our team is this list of things. If, if you're dealing with something having to do with uh, you know, influencing, influencing a quality attribute or uh, changing the way the development processes work, uh, modifying a public interface, we would s s sometimes probably consider that to be architectural. Maybe you ought to jot down an ADR if you're messing with some of those things. Uh, this is not a hard and fast rule, uh, but it is a, a good kind of uh, guide for helping people understand what they when they should be documenting these things. OK, uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, our experience using ADRs. Uh, so to understand that, first we need to, I'm going to give you a little bit of context. So uh, we're a, te a team of about nine engineers, all technical backgrounds, um, with a wide range of experience. OK, we've got some people with less than a year, uh, some people uh, maybe two or three, one or two with uh, uh, 15, 20 years, right? Get getting up there uh, very much. The, Median, though, right? we're a relatively young team overall, so very few experienced people. Um, agile processes, Scrum and XP, tailoring as we go, kind of typical stuff. Uh, we're building Watson, OK? And what is Watson? Uh, great question. So it's a, uh, right now, currently, a set of cloud-based microservices uh, with uh, many, many products uh, built um, on top of a, um, a common platform for machine learning, natural language processing, things like that. Um, within Watson, we have uh, many, many products, of which we are just one. Uh, and then within kind of our, our product area, our little neighborhood in Watson, there's about five or so teams uh, who are working all together to kind of ship that one product. Um, our product itself currently, probably around 25 or more microservices. I haven't actually tried to count it. Uh, it's just the world is changing so fast. Uh, and then across Watson, just to kind of uh, give this a little bit of context, we do have uh, some, I'll call it minimal governance, coming from you know, kind of the VP level. Uh, around things like security or the platform itself, uh, uh, the, the types of uh, uh, broad kind of patterns that we uh, should be using or encouraged to use. So that's the framework within which we are making our decisions. Okay, so we've been using ADRs since about April of last year. And here's just a little bit of data uh, to give you an idea for what that kind of looks like. Um, over the past year, uh, we produced about... Uh, 40, 40 ADRs uh, distributed very unevenly across many of our services. Uh, this was not a mandate for our team. It was a, an encouraged practice, okay? Uh, yeah, so what's going on? Some of our projects, you know, if some of our services would get started, turn out to be a bad idea, we'll just kill them, you know, not, not pursue it any further. Uh, several of them have gone to production uh, with varying levels of ADRs there. Um, I think things are a little more interesting if we look at this graph over time, okay? So, uh, yeah, so number of ADRs on the uh, y-axis, time on the x-axis. Um, you can start to see some really interesting things about how my team uh, went about design because we had that history that we were recording. So a couple of things jump out right away. Uh, you can see uh, that in some cases we preferred to take a more upfront approach, while in other cases uh, we preferred to kind of allow things evolve a little bit more. Uh, nothing good or bad about it, just an observation from the data. Uh, we, uh, you can see, let's see here, we introduced a, uh, what we're calling a cross-module uh, repository for storing uh, um, uh, 
concerns that cut, you know, or uh, cross-cutting concerns uh, about midway through the life of, of uh, this particular uh, batch of work. And I'll talk more about what's included in that uh, in a moment. Uh, you can also see that decisions seem to come in bursts, which is, I, I thought, very interesting as we were going through the data. Um, very uh, kind of bursty things. Uh, and they seem to happen every, I don't know, four to six weeks or so, uh, which uh, approximately aligns with how often we are replenishing our backlog and, and figuring out uh, when next things are coming up. So interesting observations, and uh, these are things that we can use as a part of our reflection uh, to uh, tune our process and, and kind of make sure that uh, if, um, uh, make sure we're moving in the right direction, right? If I didn't see a burst of decisions uh, for a while, I might be concerned about that, right? So uh, are we thinking about things? Uh, other interesting observations from that graph, uh, you can see that though uh, some microservices at, at kind of that uh, abstraction, that level of abstraction, were um, some were upfront, some were, were, were kind of evolving over time. The architecture in general, uh, or the decisions that we were making in it, uh, overall was very evolutionary, right? Uh, there really wasn't a lot of upfront work as a whole. Um, that being said, for every microservice, eventually they settle, and we could see a very clear point when lots of decisions were being made, and then suddenly we were done. There's just no more architecture to do, right? And uh, that's another nice data point that we can use to understand, are we spending too much time, too little? How is this changing over time? Um, I'm not going to say this is necessarily true, but it appears that you know, more code equals more architectural decisions, but that might just be a correlation, not a causation. So it could have been the people there just liked making ADRs more. I don't know. Not enough data for that. Uh, to really go one way or another. Uh, and I, I can't say, uh, notionally, I don't have the data to back this up, but it seems like in the cases where people would kind of think through the design decisions, there was less rework on those particular services uh, over the long haul. Uh, again, I, I don't have the data to back that up, but it seems that it might be true. Uh, but it could also be that people who write architecture decisions maybe just think things through more, and maybe it has nothing to do with the method at all, right? Uh, it could have just been the people involved. So I, I do wish that we had more data on this. And if you guys uh, do end up adopting this technique, uh, it would be really awesome if, if maybe you thought a little bit more about the questions you'd like to answer. And maybe we could, we could get a little more rigorous here. Um, I think there's a lot of potentially interesting areas for us to look at around uh, moving forward over the next several months. Uh, uh, when are our, our defects coming out? You know, how, how are we affecting communication? Um, how does the quality of our design decisions change over time? Things like that. Uh, and I think we've got a nice baseline to start looking into that now. Uh, okay, we did, uh, we, we did do some brief reflection uh, with the team to try and understand you know, uh, uh, qualitatively uh, how, uh, how ADRs were doing. Uh, and uh, the, the results were a little bit interesting. So uh, everyone on the team agreed that the ADR method was either useful or very useful, which is kind of cool. That being said, uh, they then told me they would only read the ADRs maybe once, uh, and they would never look at it again for, for many, many months. Okay? Uh, I don't know. Uh, it's just an interesting data point, I guess. Um, one of our data points had to do with uh, onboarding new teammates. So uh, though the team, as they were moving along, might not revisit these decisions often, uh, for someone new coming into the project, it, they turned out to be a valuable resource. They were able to go in and read the history of all the decisions that were made up to this point, what we were thinking, why, you know, why we did what we did, and how we got to where we are today, which was very, very cool. Biggest complaints, uh, there was some problem with like, oh, is this a detailed design? Is this an architectural design? You know, what should actually be documented? Um, and if you don't know you're to be looking for these things, then uh, the uh, all important architectural decisions are kind of tucked away in code repositories sprinkled throughout, uh, throughout uh, GitHub. Uh, so there's, there was some uh, uh, education that has to happen there. Um, the team really likes seeing the history of the project kind of evolving over time, and they, they really appreciated having an opportunity or a simple way to kind of improve their design thinking, the, the way that they approached uh, structured, uh, structured thought. All right, so that's our experience, and kind of based on that experience, we have a few tips for you guys to, to take home if you decide to try this. So we recommend storing ADRs in your, uh, in your code repository, wherever that is, in plain text. Uh, keep it simple, make it easy to edit, uh, easy to share. Okay? Uh, with, in our case, this let us integrate with our peer review workflow. So now we're reviewing code, but we're also reviewing design uh, at the exact same time using the exact same method. Uh, and then things were contextually close together, which if you know to look for it, turned out to be hugely advantageous. Okay, this does introduce one major problem though. 
if every microservice is kind of its own little world of its own kind of small grained uh, architecture, uh, we lose something with the, with the bigger picture. Uh, the way we solved this problem was by introducing a, a cross-cutting concerns repo that uh, repository that held um, these kind of general architectural decisions that cut across everything. So we introduce our own governance within our, our own team for what our microservices should look like, uh, how they should how they should come together, standards uh, and um, uh, key decisions with those. All right, uh, all right. We do recommend that you delegate ADR creation. If you are the architect on your team, or at least the architecture enthusiast. Right, depending on how your team is organized, you should not be the only person creating these things. This is a huge opportunity for you to kind of coach and mentor the people on your team. Super low risk, okay, and it's very easy to pair with people or to, uh, to go through the peer review process uh, to kind of teach people um, how to think about architecture and how to improve their design skills. All right, uh, I think we mentioned this briefly, but you should peer review these things using the exact same process you do your code. Uh, it's a great way to kind of spread the knowledge around and over time as the team becomes more competent uh, You can kind of just monitor things uh, instead of having to take a more active role, uh, which is uh, uh, pretty cool Something that we did not do a, a great job with but we recommend uh, Thinking about uh, is fostering that documentation habit. Okay, some of the things that we tried uh, is having a, a kind of a person uh, you know if it's you the, the architect or, or your architecture champion uh, asking the question uh, after, a, a, um, after a, an exploration, right? So if you're at the whiteboard working for a while, somebody should just ask, uh, hey, should we make an ADR for this? It goes a long way to kind of getting, uh, uh, bootstrapping the, the, the process here and kind of getting people creating these things and, and documenting them. Uh, we tracked ADRs when a decision was made to do it as a task in our backlog. It held the team accountable and kind of made sure that if we decided to, uh, if we decided to make the, the ADR, to make the document, that it would actually get done. All right, uh, you saw examples of our templates and uh, uh, definitely recommend that. Uh, another technique that we had success with was using architecture briefings. Okay, so this is a, a short presentation, 30 minutes, or left, uh, 30 minutes or less, that goes over uh, some, piece of the, uh, some piece of the system. Uh, it's all about feedback loops. So if you didn't document anything, and I may make, uh, ask you to give a briefing, you're gonna be very sad. Right? Meanwhile, if you did document some things, you just go read the history, uh, it's basically all there and very, very easy to kind of recreate and, and teach others what's going on. Architecture briefings, by the way, are another great way to kind of grow the team and get them engaged in, uh, engaged in the, the, the design process. Okay, uh, we recommend making a decision first and then documenting it. Uh, maybe that's uh, intuitive, but it, it's not really, right? So. Um, we found that decisions that were proposed before there was any kind of consensus building uh, went through terrible thrashing, and most of those pull requests were completely abandoned. Right? You, you kind of have to go through that oral history and, and talk with your teammates and build consensus before you try and shove a decision out uh, to share with the world. Uh, that being said, ADRs uh, seem to be a good way to kind of document ideas for the future. So if there's uh, an idea that you have for improving the architecture or the system in some way, you can jot it down as a proposed ADR and kind of communicate, this is something that I don't want to do today, but I think we ought to think about for the future and I don't want to forget about it, right? Uh, a nice way to just get it off your chest and so you can focus on what's required today. As a team, you can then review it again in the future uh, when and if it becomes contextually relevant. All right, a final, a final bit here. Uh, not everything is an ADR. Okay, so I don't know exactly what happened. Uh, maybe there was like a, a, an intense thirst for uh, writing documentation or, or um, you know, maybe people were, were just uh, waiting for to be told what to do or how to do something. Uh, we introduced ADRs and all of a sudden everything was an ADR, right? Uh, which is not the, not the way to do it. Uh, in response to this, we ended up introducing other uh, lightweight uh, text-based, we'll call them single responsibility records. Uh, we found that the general idea of keeping things close to the code in plain text seems to be really good, okay? So uh, we've been experimenting with views. Maybe there's a simple view template that captures just a single kind of picture uh, that, um, uh, you know, short one to two pages, the same general principles to capture that view. Uh, we've done a very good job, I think, of capturing uh, what we call design guidance or uh, design philosophy uh, kinds of ideas. Very brief, one to two page um, uh, information that helps you kind of implement the decisions that we're making. 
so that's been very successful. Uh, and then also, you know, any kind of governance or, or quality attribute kind of viewpoints uh, are other things that we're experimenting with. And they seem to be working well. Um, had I not had laptop issues, I would actually show you examples of these things. So if you're interested in that, we can, we can look afterwards and, and I, can, I can share those. All right, so quick, quick summary. So all the tips uh, for ADRs that, that we had uh, during our reflection. Um, store it with your code in plain text. Uh, delegate, use this as an opportunity to, to kind of coach and mentor. Um, do the peer reviews just like normal. Uh, work to kind of foster that documentation habit. Um, make decisions before documenting and, and remember that ADRs are just one tool. Uh, there's lots of other things that you should be kind of thinking about and documenting that don't fit this format. All right, so I just want to point this out uh, because I think it's really important. ADRs, you know, ADRs are awesome, but they are not new. Okay, they, this idea has been around for a really long time. Okay, documenting architecture decisions, cool, since at least 1997, probably even earlier than that. Okay, uh, what is it? Every four, three to five years or so, somebody writes a new paper. Uh, with a new template of how to uh, record design decisions for your architecture. It's been a standard practice uh, since the very first SEI books, okay? Uh, which is kind of odd because all of a sudden people are talking about this again. Uh, and this particular method seems to be gaining a lot of popularity and traction. Uh, and, I, and I thought that was really odd and wanted to, wanted to think about this a little bit. So what seems to be happening, I, I think anyway, is that um, Developers are, uh, of today are expecting to kind of be involved in the design process more than perhaps the traditional, uh, traditional uh, methodologies that we've had in the past. And I think this makes a lot of sense, right? So uh, we're increasing, as system, uh, system incre uh, complexity increases, uh, we modularize the system greater to kind of in response so that we can deal with that complexity. Um, but uh, so, okay, so what that means is then uh, we need to kind of raise the general level of competence of architectural thinking and design work uh, so that all of the individuals can be responsible for all these small little modules that we're breaking up uh, because, quite frankly, like, I can't handle it alone, right? We've already got on our team uh, close to a dozen microservices and there's no sign of stopping, right? I can't monitor all of that. I need to teach my team and kind of mentor them and coach them to do it. Uh, and they want to do it, right? So we need lightweight mechanisms like this to, uh, to, uh, to help. Um, yeah, so there's, there seems to be a general shift towards uh, democratizing the design authority, getting away from that central authority. Uh, and then the role of the architect, as I think we've heard a couple times at this conference, is, is shifting more towards this kind of coaching and mentoring role. And I think that these lightweight decision records like this are, are one approach for kind of enabling that kind of, uh, that kind of um, uh, leadership. All right, so uh, to wrap this up here, documenting design decisions, it seems like a no-brainer. Uh, cool since 1997, like you should be doing it already, why aren't you, right? Uh, but maybe instead of, you know, saying, hey team, I need you guys to document design decisions, uh, no thanks, no thanks. No, ADRs, they're like, yeah, I love it, we're going to do it, you know? Uh, at least that was the experience on our team, uh, and I think that you guys can uh, have the same benefit. So. Getting started, super easy, okay? Create a template, write one up, and then send it to somebody to review. Bam, you've got an ADR, you've already started, right? You don't need permission to do this. You can, you can start it on your own grassroots and, and you'll be on your way. Hmm? Works? Works? Yeah, it's, it's spectacular. So uh, I hope that uh, uh, you learned something from this talk and you got a new method to add to your silver toolbox. Uh, and. Uh, be happy to answer any questions and uh, yeah go go shameless plug please go check out buy my book uh, and uh, yeah ha happy to answer any questions <laughs>
Oh, oh no. So uh, when we introduced it, we started where we were, and we just moved forward with it. Uh, you mentioned that at least initially there were some complaints about documentation being scattered throughout the code. Um, it sounds like the team kind of got used to that, and that's probably how you want it. But for uh, maybe non-engineers or other teams or later looking back, did you encounter or explore any methods of rolling the, each in ADR up into some summary document or you know, automatic documentation tools like that? Yeah, so we haven't looked into automated, automated documentation. Uh, one of the things that uh, I'm considering anyway to help try and bring this up, uh, uh, let me think here, architecture briefings, the, those very small presentations are one way that we started doing that. Um, uh, I've been thinking about and kind of talking to, to the team about potentially introducing architecture haiku uh, as another method for um, kind of summarizing a bunch of things together uh, and, and kind of getting that um, uh, consistency. Right? There's, a, there's a worry there, right, that like all these little decisions spread about all over uh, might harm consistency. Um, but uh, I know the first, the first step was kind of making sure that we had our core governance uh, for truly cross-cutting concerns. And then quite frankly, like if we get the governance right, I don't really care what's in the individual microservices as long as people are thinking, right? And that's really the main, the main focus with this technique. architecture doc document and an anyone else read it, download it, or utilize it? How, how useful were they to other people? Yes. So uh, that's something that I think we need to look into a little bit. Uh, the, hmm, excuse me, the one, uh, one or two data points that we have on that, uh, it seems to be generally useful uh, for new people that are coming in. Um, I know the audience though really is the, the team and kind of the maintainers. Uh, so, so um, that was one of the things that led to uh, the creation of some of these other uh, lightweight um, recording methods, right? So um, ADRs were good for, for us from a technical perspective, but uh, we found that um, our product owner didn't really give a hoot, right? Uh, so we started looking at views and viewpoints and how we can create like lightweight versions of those. Um, I hope that kind of answers your question. I, I think it's an open area that we want to investigate, but I don't know, it seems to be working. Awesome. Yeah, not, not really a question, but maybe a supplement. So uh, we've been doing s very similar things on the uh, systems uh, and integration architecture level. Um, some differences, of course, you, you cannot store the architectural decision records with the code because in many of, uh, one of the projects we had like 13 European countries collaborating. Uh, we had uh, components being developed by different people. We didn't even have access to that code. Um, uh, one big difference is that we started documenting the decision as soon as we were aware that it had to be made.